We can go into meditation anyway, so we can suspend our mind just a little bit, and we can remember hearing Dujam Lingpa's elaborated instructions, as they're called, do not lose your sense of luminous awareness or open awareness. And then he says thoughts or movements within awareness. And that which understands is called awareness, non-conceptual knowingness. As we hear people walking around, we take that sound in, we integrate it. And he says, remaining in this awareness is called stillness. And never be separated from these three movements within the vast stillness. Stillness within movement and direct knowingness 
and conceptual knowingness. If you'd like some tea, there's tea upstairs too. And if we'd like, we can extend to each other this awareness inside to inside directly. And we can extend to our friends on the internet. extend to our ancestors, we can extend to the great teachers and yogis and gurus we know, we have met. We can extend to all the various traditions that we participate in. And then we'll extend to that archetypal dimension, the deities, the gods, goddesses, the archetypes, the energies, the elementals, extend to the Dakini. I really appreciate everybody coming here today, you know this blow, cold, zero. And it says observing one thought after another is not the path. Witness consciousness is not the path. Rather than sustaining your consciousness, your own consciousness of luminosity and pristine awareness, sustaining your experience of and within pristine awareness is the path. And your own awareness is ground awareness. And your own awareness is the ground of being manifesting in you as awareness. Your own awareness is being itself. This is, this is the secret path of the Dakinis, huh? Gnosis, knowingness. So this past week was Shiva Arati, the f day of Shiva, the night of Shiva, actually. So I'm going to use, <coughs> we'll focus on Shiva today, which is awareness. It's always the same topic. Many different ways of languaging it. And I'm going to especially use today Abhinagunta. And Abhinagunta was the, just like uh, Pamasambhava is to Dzogchen and Tibetan Buddhism, Abhinagunta was to Kasmish Shaivism. And I'm going to just select a number of his phrases, and sometimes with commentary and sometimes without commentary. So let's lean into each other right now, into the field. Because Abhinagunta understood that awareness is embodied. 
the embodiment of awareness. Completely. And sometimes they get lost that gets lost in Eastern thinking. Where there's a tendency to discount appearance, to discount embodiment. So, in, in many ways, uh, Benagunta's words are very contemporary. In fact, I'll pick up from him a little bit of Meloponti. They're very similar. Embodiment is the body's recollection of being. The awareness of being is always embodied. I can think in there, another frame, the Namanakaya, Kaya, that dimension of awareness is the dimension of embodiment, the, the, the dimension of flesh, embodiment. <clears throat> As Lama Torchin says, when people discount Namanakaya, discount appearance, discount embodiment, and the only true experience is just pure dharmakaya. They're discounting the oneness, the non-duality of these different dimensions, bogakaya, light forms, namanakaya, flesh, embodiment, dharmakaya, pure awareness, that they're actually completely one, completely the same. And when you do that discounting, which many spiritual traditions love to do, it creates duality at the most fundamental levels. Shiva, who is being, becomes embodied as humanness. Shiva, who is being, awareness, is a wholeness for Benagunta. Wholeness does not mean thingness, it's not an entity. Wholeness, awareness is not an entity, but it is wholeness. It is experiential. She was the great experiencer and experiencing everything and anything through all the manifestations. So you and I. The body is the place of touching and being touched by being. I'm going to, to use the metaphor of touch throughout many of his teachings because he considered touch the highest of the senses, if you will, the embodiment. It's so direct. He also embraced seeing and hearing and the apparitional dimension, sight. But focused a lot on the felt sense of being manifesting within us as us. You can see his contemporary languaging, huh? There is this bodily felt sense of being, this touching of the fullness of reality, of actuality. The bodily felt awareness of being, embodied consciousness, incarnationalism, incarnate incarnate light, incarnate knowingness. This touching, or this bodily felt awareness, is the experience of the pulsation of the inner heart essence. So that very 
source of manifestation of awareness manifesting in us arises through the heart essence. Her dime, that opening, and the energy and light manifest mind and body, and yet it's alive, and it is space, and it is energy, shakti, and it is knowingness, and it pulsates, it vibrates, it is the sublime vibrations, it is the life force, it is the amrita, because at times in embodiment it's experienced as this liquid, viscous light, the heart drops. <clears throat> A side comment, uh, many scholars more and more understand that Shaivism greatly influenced Buddhism, the Tantric Buddhists and Tibetan Buddhism. And help Buddhism move beyond Narguna. The touching of the body felt awareness is the pulsation of the heart, the heart essence. <clears throat> there are these divine sense energies of the pulsating heart, because we experience them, we feel it. Awareness is precisely the body felt awareness of Shiva. Or, here's another language, the Dharmakaya. Even in Dzogchen, they make very specific these channels, these subtle body channels. There's two that come from the heart, called the Gatri channels, and they come up around the back of our ears and to our eyes, and that helps us really see the light of awareness with our eyes. Not third eye, but plain old eyes. And not only that, but it starts to permeate the whole body. So the whole body starts to perceive the attunement of the field. Just like Avalateshwar there has all the eyes throughout his whole body. That beautiful large painting there. Awareness is experienced in and through the energies of the body, the chi, the shakti. Perhaps you're feeling it now, huh? The energy, the aliveness. And perhaps you're learning how to intensify it, pacify it, extend it, and actually magnetize with it, pull energy towards yourself. Awareness is becoming aware of and actually transforming the energies of the heart. It becomes more refined. Embodied bliss. Embodied ecstasy. Or as the tantric say, bliss overcomes suffering. The awareness of being is always embodied. And this embodiment of awareness and being is not only within our body, but completely within our circumstances. That's why we have this entwining between us and our circumstances. And though there's difference between us and the circumstances, duality, at the same time, there's non-duality within the difference, within the circumstances, because there's one awareness, one Shiva. So, this embodied experience of consciousness 
of consciousness or awareness, becoming aware of awareness within the body and through the body is the completion of realization, huh? We experience awareness within our own body and the bodies of others. The part of the essential practice is experiencing that awareness in everything and anything. That attunement, foundation attunement. Experiencing the natural non-dualness. Feeling the the resonance, the resonatingness of the radiance of the light. <clears throat> Babura Gunda describes what he calls the tattvas, which are actually dimensions like the kayas, where the very first one is sh Shiva, awareness, becomes aware of awareness. huh? And out of that Shiva becoming aware of awareness, the whole creative expression begins. She who becomes aware of awareness. Awareness becomes aware of that experience. And it continues on as the light becomes flesh, becomes earth. For that becomes the elements. and But eventually becomes luminous earth. Universe, huh? I think there are like 32 of them or something. Awareness touches awareness. Awareness awakens awareness, huh? It awakens awareness through touch, through sight, the human gaze, through hearing, mantras, through smelling, certain type of fragrances, through imagining, through thinking, through language. And much of this <clears throat> process begins at the non-discursive level in the body, actually, actually below the heart, non-discursive, thought-free, experience, but non-discursive experience. And then it begins churning and moving, and then it begins to manifest huh? <clears throat> as vibration, pulsation, sound, syllable, ah, uh, syllables, words, and then signs and signification. So the languaging itself brings forth and deepens the beingness of being. It is being itself expressing, manifesting being. And we all participate in manifestations of that creativity. Then he says, awareness is a kind of knowing, but this is not a disembodied cognition or mentalistic representation, <clears throat> or even simply the witness, the objectified witness, kind of staring out. It is participatory. It's experiential. It's non-dual. Embodied awareness. The body's recollection of being. By recollection, he's not talking about the memory. It's that recollecting, that bringing in the experiencing of a being. Being is there manifesting, but the body amplifies the experience in a particular way <coughs> and is part of the amplification process. This awareness becoming awareness, which is ground awareness, being awareness, makes contact with being as being. 
being is awareness. And not unlike the later phenomenologists, there's pure be being, which is not a being. So Shiva is not a being. He's not a guy. A being, which is not a being, manifests being in all the beings. Manifesting being in all the beings, then through experiencing our own being and the being in other beings, we experience primordial being itself. Just as we are. No decorations needed. No improvement. Being is awareness, knowingness. Then, there's this intense vigilance with being, experiencing, and this intimate union between self and other. One touches and makes contact with being through beings. So the very path of beings is all these beings, all kinds, huh? The very path into being is within our own being and all the beings, all the circumstances. And this is really the essence of the true tantras, the essence of Dzogchen also, huh? There's a sense of inner touching which is the bodily felt sense of being. And this is a felt sense of presence, like being touched within, and the self arising in the sense of presence. Touching and knowing are the same. Touching the beingness of being through touching a being. You know? There's your pooch. Touch your pooch, your dog, cat, bird, maybe ants, and there's being arising. <clears throat> this gets certain people really nervous. The beingness of being and all the beings. <clears throat> A lot of this uh, framing goes against the Brahmanical, the Brahman's purity, the path of purity, because the, the Shaivites see everything is pure, and Dzogchen, everything is pure, because it's being itself. But dressing this, or caste, it undoes caste systems, the untouchables and the pure Brahman, Brahmins, it undoes lots of certain type of rituals. It takes the ordinariness of life as liberation. Full self-awareness is experienced through otherness as self-awareness. Awareness entering awareness as awareness. That human beings have this capacity for their awareness, which seems contained within their own bodies, to go beyond the body bo body boundaries. Actually, they're infinitely beyond the body boundaries, and but the experientialness grows steadily, step by step. So the capacity of awareness entering awareness is direct knowingness and extension. And out of that practice, the intensification of awareness becomes more and more expanded. Smell, taste, form, all become more subtle and more subtle. And there's a touch that is the pure sky of consciousness. So very, very developed yogis have this touch. That's the pure sky of consciousness. And to receive that touch is really fantastic because it opens the sky-like awareness to be felt in us. Sort of like it takes one to know one. So Shiva, who is awareness, 
manifest awareness as light forms, becoming flesh forms. Very similar in the, in the Dzogchen, the Dharmakaya, who is awareness, pure awareness, manifest awareness as the light forms. Some Bogakaya, the apparitions, the vortexes, the energies, the deities, Dakinis, and then archetypes, and then they become flesh forms. Someone like Swami Muktananda would say, well, I, I see my guru and everything and everyone. Doesn't mean he was seeing that particular form, but the very essence of awareness. One experiences liberation in their very body. The path of liberation is through embodiment. And would even go far to say, if you dissociate so much, and you lose embodiment, you may be missing the quick path to completeness. And that's why a lot of times in literature it takes eons to become uh, realized if you take dissociative methods. Huh? One may experience liberation in their very embodiment. And how do you experience this? There's bliss, there's trembling, there's a whirling of the vortexual sense, the column arising in the body, there's vortexing, there's the pulsations. And then he says, touch itself can indu invoke non-dual awareness. You can think of the Sistine Chapel, huh? And there are the fingers touching, huh? non-dual awareness. So through duality, non-duality arises. Constant theme. Compassion itself is a bodily felt sense. The luminous light becoming warmth, moving through the heart, moving through the body beyond. The energy, the amrita of the great compassion. Then he says, Awareness surges forth and expands and extends and pulsates and it overflows and comes surging forth. Babinakunta focused a great deal on the creativity of the awareness, that awareness of being. To be in the awareness of being is to be completely creative. So that's why the arts and art and the aesthetics of art and the rasa of art is the aesthetics of art. He considered the best way to understand realization is an aesthetic state, an aesthetic experience. Mm, he describes the intertwining of self and others and the fusion of the senses. This intertwining of the fusion of senses. It's interesting that later Meloponti, the great phenomenologist, picks up some of these same themes. Malaponti was trying to recover the body for for consciousness. The early phenomenologists were very idealistic and disembodied. And he challenged the disembodiment of consciousness, just not unlike Abhinagunta. <clears throat> Typical in, uh, in places where Shaivism was at, you might have people practicing Vedanta or Vedic, like the ordinary people do practicing Vedic and the Vedic rituals. And then there would be certain people introduced to the Shaivistic understanding. Huh? And both describe, both Abhinav Gunter and uh, Meloponti describe the role of the senses in awareness is synesthetic or synesthesia. It means the, the senses are in union, they're in oneness. When you're experiencing phenomena, you're not separating seeing from hearing or feeling, but the, it is the more natural state is a synesthetic state where the senses are 
in oneness. That's the richness and the aesthetics of the rasa, of the experience. And then if we get too mentalistic, we can start separating the senses out. And again, oh, he, Melopotia also, as Abu Gunta emphasizes, that there's this pre-discursive experience, pre-thought, pre-talking experience. And then this is where the innate oneness of the senses are, and non-dual awareness is, and knowingness is. So at times to get to that, you suspend your mind, like the epoche, you suspend your mind, you focus your awareness down, you go beyond, you leave your mind, and you focus into the awareness state, and then you feel nothingness, and then you feel something, and the surging, moving, movement, and the felt sense, and then it becomes, it starts becoming known. Vimarsa is the word of awareness. Is at times described as the embodied experience of this intertwining yamala of self and others. A process that involves all the senses, infusion or harmony, melana. By fusion of the senses, Abhinaguntu refers not only to the fusions of the senses with one another, but also the integration of the senses within the whole range of bodily and consciousness. One becomes more and more pervaded by the divine sense energies. So sometimes when people are feeling it, they feel their body being stretched and they jerk around and tremble a bit. And, and, and it's really part of the stretching of the, of the body of light being formed and being experienced. And the word entwining means ultimately we're all always at a basic level in non-dual awareness even if we don't know it. Or even St. Thomas Aquinas says the same thing. The knower and the known are always in oneness. You can't know anything unless you're in oneness. <clears throat> and the Descartes thinking. By entwining and fusion of the senses received particular attention by the great French phenomenologist Maurice Meloponti. And Meloponti was a attempted very much to recover the body for consciousness or awareness and challenging those who had a disembodied approach. Many traditions do. Many ancient ones do. There's a certain philosopher who was a follower of Meloponti named David Abraham. He wrote a book called The Spell of the Sensuous. And he focused greatly on Meloponti's understanding of the role of the senses in awareness. Even the great Rangchampa, who was a precursor to Longchampa, 11th century, perhaps one of the greatest masters, would say there's gnosis of awareness, which is very direct, and there's gnosis of the mind, which is awareness coming through the mind and us perceiving through the mind. That's why we can experience the divine divinity of this existence through our mind as awareness permeates our mind. That's why even at times in like the Nigma tradition which is very influenced by Shaivism, you at times you separate your mind, you suspend your mind, you enter awareness to have a hit of awareness and be in awareness, be located there, be locating from being in your mind, and then you integrate your mind very directly into the awareness field. I say this over and over again because it's so easily forgotten, right? And then suffering arises. So, Meloponti would also use the word synesthesia. And synesthetic awareness is to be understood for many people as a marginal phenomena. If you have that, people think you're weird, or you will think you're even weird. But actually, and you'll be very sensitive to environmental experiences. And that's because of sensitivity of perception and embodiment. But for Meloponti and many others who knowledge and awareness, it's the natural capacity of human beings. And every pre-discursive experience involves a fusion of the senses and non-dual awareness. And it's only after the initial pre-discursive experience where there is a turn or a manifestation of discurs discursive cognition 
So the senses and the corresponding sense experiences become separated from one another. So Abraham writes this, If I attend closely to my non-verbal experience of the shifting landscape that surrounds me, and again here both Abhinaguntu and Meloponti and these people say, when you focus on awareness, it's not a solipsistic state. If I'm focusing within me, I'm also experiencing the situation that I'm in. Because I enter in my own awareness, I experience the situation that I am in. And actually, rather than being in my mind alone, I have more direct experience of what's happening around me. In other words, it has survival uh, advantages. If I attend closely to my nonverbal experience of the shifting landscape that surrounds me, I must acknowledge that the so-called separate senses are thoroughly blended with one another, and it's only after the fact that I'm able to step back and isolate the specific contributions of my eyes, my ears, and my skin. As soon as I attempt to distinguish the share of any one sense from that of the others, I inevitably sever the full participation of my sensing body with the sensuous terrain. So there's always a blending of the senses in the inherent, the precognition perception. Meditation takes you and I into the preconceptual gnosis. That's why it has such a self-regulatory effect on us, and it actually heightens perception, heightens aliveness. And then we learn to speak from that place. And then the power of speech becomes more and more ours and the power of hearing, and the power of seeing, the power of feeling, the power of gazing. And begin to access naturally the power, the embodiment of this world is flesh, then the apparition opens naturally for us, and pure awareness opens. Or as Husserl would say so often for every one of his lectures, what is the wonder of all wonders? Pure awareness, Shiva. And that the doorway is our own subjectivity. So we'll extend to each other from this inner awareness, Shiva. Shiva extends to Shiva. So we'll extend to that great master of Benagunta this morning. So we'll extend to that contemporary master of Shaivism, Swami Muktananda. Madra, the most, many madras between Shaivism and uh, <coughs> Dzogchen are shared. Ah is a central mantra in both of them. Ah, the primordial Ah. Aham ah. I am who I am. Shared by both of them. Aham ah. I am.
Ahama is also the signature of awareness, becoming aware of awareness.
Shiva Panchana Sahita 
Shiva Jaya 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 Jaya
<clears throat> so we've been cultivating awareness for about an hour now. So let's focus on people we know and love, <coughs> excuse me, who may be having difficulties. And we'll extend that awareness, which is the great compassion, inside to inside directly. As Young Tom Rinpoche describes it, extending into the person's present, extending into the person's past, and extending into their future. So as we end up this morning, I'll read some little invocations. This one's called the Rigpa Guru Yoga Practice. Ah, Rigpa. Awareness of awareness is the primordial guru. So I take refuge in the self-recognizing, self-experienced nature of my own awareness. And because of this lack of knowingness, human beings wander and suffering. So may all sentient beings reach the great self-liberation by experiencing their nature as primordial awareness. So all the demons, malicious forces, and even their concepts and names fall apart. The very nature of all phenomena is the Dharmadhatu and the unchanging self-arising wisdom is actually your only protection. There's another one. This is called the Great <coughs> Invocation of, of Prayers and Blessings. Oma Hung Hiri. So within this palace of the Lord, ablaze the great bliss, Yanakaya. Yana means knowingness, dimensions of knowingness. So the wisdom, embodiment, realizing bliss and emptiness individually is the very nature of the lotus endowed with unbound bliss. And from this, the glory of the great shining Vajra sun manifest as the Dharmakaya, Amita Tabla is the energy of that one, Sambhogakaya, Aloteshwar, Lord of the World, kindness taking the form through the force of compassion, and Manakaya, this dissolving of samsara and nirvana, and the great Lord Haruka, who overcomes the animate and inanimate world, and Vajravahari, the secret primordial wisdom, the treasure of great bliss, Haragiva, the one who desires sublime bliss, the goddess, the Kurukule, the Dakini Kurukule, the enchantress of all beings, the magnetizing energies, and the lord of sublime and, sub and mundane mudras who dances the dance in bliss and spaciousness. So with that, we can rub our hands together, place in our hearts. Thank you everyone for coming this morning in this freezing, freezing place. Hope you had a great time this morning with meeting Abhinagunta. And I'll put one more chant on. You're welcome to stay and meditate. 
if you want, <clears throat> to 9 o'clock. And there's also some refreshments upstairs. And 